Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me uh, this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we're going to be going through a talk, as the actual slide says there, how to photograph everyday people. And I, I kind of don't include that title there as to be a little bit of clickbait. It really is to kind of go through the methods that I've kind of experienced over the last few years that have helped me to, to get the very best out of people that ordinarily wouldn't be in front of a camera. I'm not somebody who um, I would say photographs models. It's just not something that I've really done much of since I've been a photographer. And it's not something that I'm really that kind of enthused by doing. You know, I mean, I, I really do like to be able to photograph just, as the title says, everyday people. But the thing with photographing everyday people is it's how do you get somebody to be relaxed in front of the camera? How do you actually capture the real them? That's what I want to go through with you now, because I really have over the last couple of years. Again, we'll probably actually ignore last year ever happened. So we'll say the last three years then. Uh, I've learned so much by actually getting out there and doing it rather than being told it, reading it in a book, watching it on a video. So I want to kind of just show you, share with you my experience. Before we get into that, obviously, with this being a, a webinar on behalf of uh, WEX and BenQ, they have got uh, just a couple of, well, I've got one thing to let you know about. It's just this little slide here I've just put together. There's a little code at the top uh, with it being Christmas. You know, there's always uh, little offers going on. BenQ5 is the code. If you use the, the web address underneath, Wex Photo Video, you can get 5% um, off. And that's up until the 23rd of December. So everybody's a winner. Any little discount, I'm always up for it. But um Let's dive in. I'll remind you that as we go through this. Uh, again, any questions you've got as well, use the facility that you've got with this uh, uh, online streaming platform to be able to ask any questions. We can always go through those as well. That code, by the way, is on BenQ monitors. And that's what I'm looking at as I go just over to the right hand side here. All right, let's let's uh, let's get into this then. So before we actually talk about the actual uh, process of how to relax somebody in front of the camera, how to get the very, very best out of them, Let's strip things back to their basics. And this will make sense as we go through this, I promise you. But I think we need to kind of strip it back to the basics so that I know that we're kind of all, for want of a better phrase, singing from the same song sheet, all right? So I'm gonna ask you this question quite a bit as we go through this. But the question is, what is a successful portrait? Now, I know you can't answer me because we're doing this. It's only me that can, you know, get get to speaking out here. And I can't hear a word you're saying. But just think about this in your head or maybe get a piece of paper and write it down. But what to you is a successful portrait? Now, is a successful portrait, is it all about composition, sharpness, skin tone, uh, the lighting? Or is it actually about the expression of the person that we're photographing? depending on what you kind of uh, think is a successful portrait will obviously determine what kind of results that you get but when I kind of first started out I know that my my opinion on that on what is a successful portrait was very very different to what it is now in fact my role as a photographer I viewed very differently back then to what I do now so remember that question what is a successful portrait but let's like I said we're going to strip this back to the basics really kind of you know go back to grassroots here if you like and let's let's really talk about some simple things here first of all photography what is photography okay it's defined as being drawing with light and i've got a couple of definitions here the first one says that photography is the process or art of producing images of objects on sensitized surfaces by the chemical action of light or of other forms of radiant energy as x-rays gamma rays or cosmic rays the other definition I've got is photography refers to the process or practice of creating a photograph, an image produced by the action of light on a light sensitive material. Man, that sounds so incredibly sterile. If somebody told me that that's what photography is all about and that's what being uh, taking pictures is all about, I really don't know if I would have been a photographer. But that's what it is in its simplest terms. So that's the photography. Now, this is all about taking pictures of people. So we're talking portraits. So what is a portrait? Now, a portrait, in its uh, simplest terms, is described as a likeness of a person. Again, I've got a couple of definitions here, and it says a, a portrait is a painting, a drawing, a photograph, or engraving of a person depicting only the face or the head and shoulders. 
also says that I it says a likeness of a person, especially of the face as a painting, drawing or photograph. But splitting this down even more, what does likeness mean? Now, likeness says that this is a fact or quality of being alike or resemblance. So we know what photography is. We now know what a portrait is. And a portrait is saying that it's capturing the likeness of somebody. And that is what they're saying is the likeness. So is that what it is? Is that what being a portrait is, taking a portrait is all about? Just capturing their resemblance or their likeness? Or is it more than that? You see, I kind of think, and I'm hoping that you do too, that it's all about capturing the person, not just the likeness of them, but their character, who they are, all right? Let's rewind a few years to when I kind of first started out. And I, I've already told you that my thought that my role as a photographer was very different to what I think it is now. Uh, but here's pretty much uh, two photos from the very first paid photo shoot that I had. This was with a, a young lad called Tom Colley, who was an actor uh, and also a musician. He wanted some uh, promo kind of pictures doing. And at the time of doing them, I remember I was really kind of pleased with them. You know, I thought that was, I was really pleased. The lighting was kind of, you know, it worked. The black and white worked. But the more I look at it nowadays, what have we got here? Have, have we got a good portrait? You know, yes, it is, you know, it's, it's captured it onto light sensitive material or onto a digital camera, obviously, onto a sensor. And yes, it looks like Tom Colley. So I suppose if we look at it in its sterile terms, as those descriptions said, yes, it's a portrait. But to me, it kind of just looks lifeless. It's just stood there. What about these two pictures here? My style of retouching as well. This is kind of showing here that when I when I was really into this going back a few years now, where I do like a three light setup to create kind of really gritty, moody kind of pictures. Are these a successful portrait? Is Are these portraits? Well, yes, they are capturing, you know, that image onto that light sensitive material or that sensor. And they look like the people that were in front of the camera. So, yes, you could say that it's a portrait. But again, look at it. It's kind of lifeless. I mean, the guy there holding the gun is a good friend of mine called Glenn. He's got a gun with him, but is, does, do you get any kind of feeling from it? Or is it just a guy that's dressed in a leather jacket holding a gun? It just seems a bit lifeless to me. Do you know what I mean? But at the time, I thoroughly enjoyed doing them. Now, let's take a look at these ones here, because I used to photograph a lot of uh, physique athletes, sports, uh, sportsmen and women because of my background, having been involved in bodybuilding. That's the kind of natural way that I gravitated towards when I was really kind of looking for people to photograph. Uh, these two people here, they are legitimate bo um, boxers. The guy on the left is a great friend of mine called Steve Cook. The lady on the uh, right there, a lady called Sam, is a boxer. But again, do you feel kind of like intimidated by them? Do you get a feeling of a real presence about them? Or, I mean, especially maybe in the, the girl on the right-hand side there. She's just kind of looking through you. Are they looking, that's, and that's the thing, are they looking at you? Or are they looking through through you do you feel a connection with that person i kind of say no i really would say no now is this also when i say is it a good portrait is it a good portrait is it a good photograph or is it more a case of it's a kind of okay photo with a you know a bit of retouching on it really this might sound a bit odd now to say this but if you're in if somebody kind of uh recommended a restaurant or sorry you'd recommended a restaurant to somebody Bear with me. You'd recommended a restaurant. That person goes to the restaurant. And when you see them the next time, they say to you, or you say to them, how was it? Did you, what was the restaurant like? And they say to you, yeah, the food looked nice. Or if they said to you, oh, the food was delicious. Massive difference, which is best. It's obvious, isn't it? The food looked nice or it was delicious. Now, when we talk about this in terms of photography and our portraits, What's best when you show a picture to somebody and somebody's reaction is, oh, nice lighting. Would you be happy with that? Or if you're a portrait photographer, would you be more happy if the reaction from that person looking at it said, oh, that is so them. You have so captured them. Now, to me, it's the second one. That's what I would crave. Not, it's always nice, obviously, for somebody to say that your lighting's nice. But that's more on the photographer's opinion. But the general person who I wanted to show this picture to is where, for me, is, is where the best praise comes from. It's when they say, that is so them. And you're only going to get the reaction of that is so them when the person is comfortable with you 
completely relaxed and there has been a connection. Let's go back to this picture of the boxer, Steve Cook. The left hand picture was the one I've shown you already. The right hand side picture now is one that I took a few years later because me and Steve have become really good friends. Now look at the difference, especially when I zoom in on this. The picture on the left, the very first show to, uh, photo shoot I had with Steve, I think he's, look, he's just kind of looks, up. it's like, hello, hello, is there anybody there looking straight through you? But look at the difference of the picture on the right hand side. To me, I, I kind of look at that portrait and wherever I go, his eye seems to be following me. He's definitely, there's definitely a connection there. I'm really hoping you can see the difference between those two. So and that's all come down from time, getting to know somebody. And like I said, it's all about having a connection. And I, tr I truly believe, and I never thought I'd be talking about stuff like this. If I think about my, my previous life and what I've kind of things I've done, I feel like I'm getting a little bit on the arty side. But what I really have learned when it comes to taking successful portraits, what I see as a successful portrait, is that a successful portrait only occurs when there is a connection between the subject and the photographer. Now I know that when it comes to taking pictures of people, if you take it for for the you know for the fun of it, then great, you've got all the time in the world. Now when I take portraits, there is no there's no rush. I've got friends of mine who work in that kind of industry where you know it, they literally would have maybe a couple of minutes with the people, but they themselves, even though they've only got a couple of minutes to to be able to sort of have a connection just within that couple of minutes, they've kind of got it down to a fine art because that's the way they have to work. They do know how to kind of work with people. But there's nothing like having a connection. You can tell, you really can tell when you look at a portrait, whether or not it's just a picture of somebody or that the photographer and the person pictured got a connection. All right. Look at these pictures here then. As we moved on then in my photography life, I've moved away from doing the kind of like physique stuff, the gritty stuff. And now I am generally photographing just people friends family and, and clients as well but photographing people that aren't into that kind of rugged kind of thing it's, it's a photo the idea of the portrait is to capture them okay look at these guys here definite difference now think back to the ones at the start the tom collie picture the female boxer the, the early picture of steve cook big difference now when we look at their eyes there is absolutely a connection there look at these pictures here world war ii veteran on the left hand side there my friend dave clayton's his mom there you can just tell that those people were relaxed in front of the camera. And these aren't people who are used to being photographed. This is the thing, it's how do we get these people to be relaxed in front of us? The first thing is we don't rush. We don't rush. We're gonna talk about it in a moment, exactly what the way that I go through this. And it's, it's, not, it's nothing kind of complicated. It really isn't complicated at all. It's kind of taking, it's becoming comfortable with your photography so much that you can almost forget about the technicals that then frees you up to able to be able to spend more time with the subject. But just a reminder then, look at those, the difference between that one and the ones before, massively. Now I've talked about the last few years of how, sorry, I've talked about how in the last few years I have learned more about photographing people who aren't models, just everyday kind of people. I've learned more about how to do that to get the best out of them in that last couple of years. And that's because of a personal project. Now, if you've followed me for some time, you're aware of who I am, you might know of a project that I've had that has actually able to start up again very, very soon because of the way the restrictions are all going, although it is getting a bit twitchy at the moment isn't it but up until uh, March 2020 I was working a lot on a project if you don't know what it is it was a project about World War II and uh, I actually started to do it to photograph uh, these uh, people just regular people who were reenactors I didn't want to photograph models where I'm kind of looking for people who were you know, they, they did modeling for, a, a, that's what they did basically, a living. I was having to think of styling and posing and think of a set. That just wasn't my thing. I wanted to photograph characters. And I went to see this film, uh, which was a few years ago now. And I remember coming away from that film thinking, they're the kind of people that I want to photograph, just real characters. And I've always had a fascination with World War II and, you know, the 1940s and what have you. Now, a friend of mine at the time told me that there was a local group near where I lived that did this kind of thing they reenacted this kind of stuff i got in touch with them they invited me along to come and see them now my usual way of 
uh, maybe getting to sort of photograph somebody would be to kind of try to explain to them what I wanted to do. But what I thought when I was going to photograph these people, because they did this reenacting so much, they would have been photographed so often that when I tried to explain what I wanted to do, it's very likely that in their minds, they would be thinking that it was only going to be like every other photograph they've had done before. So one of the ways that I kind of got them on side, first of all, was to show them photographs by photographers whose work I really liked and they had the similar feel to what I wanted to do. Not to replicate them exactly, but it showed the idea of the pictures being uh, timeless and classic. That's the kind of look that I wanted. So when I first of all went to see these people, rather than me trying to explain to them what I wanted to do, I showed them these pictures and straight away they were on side. Now that's actually something I used to do when I was photographing physique people. Rather than trying to say, oh, well, can I come and take your picture? I would actually show them photographs of people like I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone and certain poses and saying, this would really work for you. I'd love to do this kind of picture with you. It just works. Rather than you trying to convince them to get in front of the camera, if you can show them so they in their minds can then think, I like the look of that, so much easier to get in front of the camera. But I showed these people these pictures and it was up and running. That was it. They wanted to be part of it. And we did this. I kind of uh initially before i was doing this kind of project here i was always concerned about technicals i was always chopping and changing things using one light then using two lights reflectors and blah blah blah, blah over complicating stuff and by doing that it almost made me forget about the person in front of the camera because i was so stressed about the technicals but when i was doing this project when it started off i stripped it back to basics and used just one light kept it simple and i'd practiced it over and over and over again with friends family even on a mannequin head a polystyrene mannequin head in the garage on a light stand practiced it over and over so when it came to photographing the people the technicals was easy it was just something that i'd done over and over again and that freed me up to be able to spend more time to slow down to relax and spend more time talking and getting to know the person in front of the camera I also kind of started to realize that it wasn't the technicals that needed to change. It was just the subject matter in front of the camera. Because my concerns back then were that if I kept doing the same thing, the same kind of technicals, then all my pictures would look the same. But that's not the case. You know, I always think about Annie Leibovitz. You know, you sort of look at her portfolios from like the 80s, 90s, current day. You know, you look in her portfolio, you know it's her because there's a certain style. But do all the pictures look the same? not at all now when she's take when she's doing portraits if it's not for something in like a big elaborate shoot for like vanity fair where there's just countless amounts of kids everywhere when it's like a one or two people she's using the same kind of lighting as what you've seen here just one light to the side and forward to create like a classic timeless rembrandt style of lighting and she can spend more time getting to know and relaxing the subject in front of the camera now this kind of subject, this this project here started to grow because it was for me it was it was like a marriage made in heaven, you know I was kind of photography World War Two it was just perfect and we started to do other different pictures as well like this one here this was a guy in uh, young lad in Wales my friend Anthony kind of arranged all this uh, photographed in Cardiff Central Railway Station on a really busy Saturday, um, but yeah fantastic but I started to share these images online. And I got contacted out of the blue by a guy who said that he'd love to be able to use this picture for the front cover of a book that he was writing. And it wasn't a book that was going to you know, go on Amazon and make him his fortune. It was actually a book for his church group where he was recording the stories, the life stories of the eldest members of his congregation. And he wanted to capture those. And I kind of said, look, you can have the picture. No problem. So long as I can come along and photograph the people that are going to be in the book regular everyday people not models just regular people and that's what i did i took along a little table that i got from an antique shop just put it down in front and it wasn't like a conveyor belt system you know like i, I waited for their service to finish at the church i'd set my my background up real simple small amount of space brought them over to the chair and it wasn't a case of getting the camera out and going for it straight away it was slow down camera was to one side just spending some time just sitting there talking getting to know them and what I realized was when we were chatting about anything and everything you could physically see them starting to relax because they realized it wasn't a case of in sit down photo and out it was just calm it was relaxed they started then 
sitting in positions that were obviously naturally comfortable for them. There was no posing going on here. So although they'd kind of, I'd put that table there, they just rested their arm on it, sitting really comfortable. You could see the shoulders start to drop because it was no stress. It was slowed down. And in fact, when it did come time to take the picture, which was maybe five or 10 minutes later, I didn't say to them, oh, bring that picture up onto your chest. It was just something that they naturally felt was the right thing to do. So it just made things great. And this wasn't a project here when I photographed these people where I went in, got the pictures and was never seen again. You know, with this one here, we made some friends. We went out for lunch afterwards. It was just, it was, it was lovely. It was how photography should be. Do you know what I mean? It was just really, really pleasant. So when it came to the posing, that was, that was one of the things actually that used to stress me out. And also not just me stressing out, but the person I was photographing, I could see them stress out because when the more I was starting to, you know, before pushing and pulling people left, right and centre, put your arm here, put your leg there, tilt your head, do this, do it just ruined it. It completely ruined it. And you could see them starting to stress out, but not with these people. It was just relaxed. I don't think at one time ever I told them to put an arm here and do this. They just naturally sat there and relaxed. Now, this kind of led on to me working on a project photographing World War II veterans. And this is where the real learning came in photographing people. Now, veterans, yeah, of course, you know, being the very nature of who they are, they would have been photographed a lot. But that would have been a lot of times at events and functions. And it's more a case of a quick snap and what have you. I wanted to give the veterans a classic timeless portrait. And this is where this project that I had really took off. It's called the 39 to 45 Portraits Project. And I was giving veterans, still am, giving veterans a classic timeless portrait that they keep and can stay with their family. And that's at no cost to them. But photographing these veterans here was just the most amazing thing. But one really good thing about doing this so much now, practicing the same kind of lighting style over and over and over again, it didn't mean that I kind of got to know everything about it because that's the great thing about photography. We never know it all, but we can become comfortable with it. And now that's how it happened with me that when I was photographing these people, like this guy here, Laurie Whedon, wonderful man. The only place I had to photograph him was in the galley of his kitchen. So, you know, not the luxury of space like in a studio. This is in his own home because this project has to be done at their convenience, not my convenience. Now, when it's in people's homes, with that come the challenge of space, lack of it as opposed to too much. But because I'd gone over that lighting style over and over, it meant that I was able to adapt so you can see here the picture on the right hand side, you know, you've got like a, the, the softbox there in the earlier picture. It was a bigger softbox, but I don't got the space for it in here. But we know as photographers that a small light source in close will give the same softness of light as a big light further back. So just little things like that, having that, comf you know, being that comfortable with the lighting and that particular setup enabled me to not stress about the technicals. It enabled me to have a connection with the subject I was photographing. You can see it in here as well. There's one thing as well, uh, one thing that I did learn with this, which has made, I found has made a huge difference to when I photograph people. And again, this is, you know, this is my style, but if you don't do this, it's definitely worth giving it a try. You can see here when I'm photographing this veteran, a guy called Reg Charles. Now my camera, as in the previous picture, you'll see that it's on a tripod. You know, you can just about see the light to the top right hand corner coming down. So we've got that single light to the side and further forward of the subject. But my camera's on a tripod and I've had people in the past kind of ask me, you know, what's the point of that? You know, you're using flash. You know, you don't need to have a tripod because flash freezes motion. But the actual reason for it has got nothing to do with the flash whatsoever. It's got everything to do, though, with relaxing the subject. Let me just quickly explain that. So let's just say if I was going to photograph you, this is my process when I'm photographing veterans, and it's pretty much the process when I'm photographing anybody. But when I first of all come to where you are, be it your home or your office or whatever, I don't bring any kit into there, into the place at all. So I'll knock on the door. In the example of a veteran, knock on the door. When they open the door, bear in mind these are people who don't really want to be photographed. If they're honest, you know, they're doing it because they know it's the right thing to do because it, it kind of gives a picture to the family and so on and so forth. But when they open the door, I'm not laden down with kit. It's all in the car because that first half an hour or whatever isn't about taking the picture. It's about us getting a connection. So I'll go into the house. We'll sit down. 
have a tea or a coffee and we'll just chat. You know, we'll talk about anything and everything. We probably, if I can help it, won't even talk about the photo shoot because that's obviously what they're going to be really concerned about. But we won't even talk about that. We'll talk about all kinds of things. And there really is no time limit on it. But you kind of get a feel for it when you know that you are relaxed in each other's company and it just feels good. You know, there's maybe a bit of laughter. That is when I would say, actually, tell you what, let's get that portrait done. That's what I'm here for. I would then go to the car and get the kit. But because I'm comfortable with the setup, this is the key thing. I'm comfortable with knowing what I'm going to be doing with the lighting and what have you. When I'm setting it up, I can keep the conversation going. Now, before, when I was always chopping and changing things and just trying to be clever, it kind of made me get stressed about the technical. So when it came to me setting up, I would kind of clam up and I would almost start to ignore the person that I was photographing. Now, the danger there is that when you're setting up, if you then suddenly go quiet while you're thinking, right, I've got to put this here, that's got to go there, that's on that setting. This person who's not used to being photographed and maybe feels a little bit self-conscious about being photographed, their head now is going to start to fill with all the thoughts of being photographed. So you're going to start to undo all that good work of when you were sitting there talking over a cup of tea and coffee. So keep the conversation going. Once the setup is there, that's when I would then get the person in front of that particular backdrop. I then come to my, get my camera, I put my camera on the tripod and I put the focus point on their face. And then all I will do is I'll come behind the camera, but my face never goes behind it. I'm always above it, maintaining that eye connection with the person. And my finger is just resting on that shutter button. So we can just keep on the conversation going nice and calm, nice and relaxed. And eventually at some point I'll then go, actually do me a favor, just look straight down the lens for me just there. That's it, just hold, that's it, click. Anyway, what were you saying about that again? So there's no build up, there's none of that cheese, ready, ready, none of that kind of stuff going on. We're maintaining the eye contact. I did find before that, you know, I'd be talking, talking, talking. The minute I then got behind the camera, my face was hidden by it. You could visibly see the person start to think, oh, here we go, here we go. Any second now we're gonna have a picture taken. And it just ruined everything. Just maintaining the eye contact kind of distracts them in a way. So that's my 39 to 45 project that I was kind of working on. And yes, it kind of grew more and more. This picture here of this guy, you know, I mean, I'm really hoping as you look at this, you can see that he was not stressed out when we were taking this picture. He was comfortable. In fact, when I look at this face of this man now, I just want to, every time I see it, I just want to reach out and grab it. And you, I mean, you, you can look at that face and you just know you've likely never met this man, Valerian Yavorsky, but you know, when you look at that face, that's a nice man. You can tell the kind of person that he is. And that's because we just spent time slowing down, talking, finding out about him, all sorts of different stuff, just chat, 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 chat. And the photography almost became something secondary for me being there. A second, it, wasn't, it didn't seem like the main reason that I was there chatting with him. But we chatted about all sorts. I'll never forget it. He was telling me as we were talking, he was talking about how the fact that when he was a young man, he was living in Poland during the war, you know, uh, that the Russians came to his village. They took him and his parents uh, and other families onto a train, sent him away to a, a forced labor camp. Years later, he escapes. He joins the military and he fights at Monte Cassino, which was just a bloodbath. If you know anything about military history, it was an absolute bloodbath. But how do I know this? Because we talked and we and I listened and it was just fun. It was just great being in each other's company. I even made sure that I got his wife, Glenis, to get out of her seat. She didn't want to be photographed, but I got her out of her seat to make sure that I captured a picture of the two of them together. Now, the reason I tell you this as well, not just to say, oh, look how relaxed they are, was because of this email here. Now, this email is, a, is from a lady called Maria, Maria Leakblade. And she's the lady who initially contacted me to see if I would photograph Valerian Yavorsky or Valek as he was known. Now, this email came in about three weeks after I'd photographed Valek and he'd got his print. Uh, and I remember being at home, I vividly remember it, getting this email come through in the evening, about nine o'clock at night, my phone lights up, it's never far away from me. I look at it and sure enough, there's this email. Now you're probably reading that, you can see that it's basically Maria saying that Valek had passed away. And I was thinking, what? That was only three, I, I was with him three weeks ago. How could that possibly be the case? It just didn't seem right. And it really took the wind out of my sails. But 
that's just the way it is you know this is you know you choose to do a, a project a, a photography project where you're photographing very elderly people it's just the way it goes but the more i looked at the email those little things started to pop out to me the first one being this one of course it's always lovely when people say that it's a beautiful image that's always nice when you're a photographer that somebody says oh lovely photo but also how they said it's incredibly important to them that's what's interesting but also thank you for spending time with him that was kind of like wow it wasn't just about going there getting the picture it was way more than that so yeah so i have learned uh in short i've really learned that my role as a photographer is very different to what my role was or what I thought my role was right at the start. You see, I thought that my role as a photographer was all about the technicals. You know, I'm the one that's got the camera. I understand light composition. I knew where to put the light in, how to hard light, soft light, all that. That's my, that's my thing. The person in front of the camera, well, that's kind of down to you, especially if it's a model. You do your thing, I'll do my thing very very different attitude towards it now in fact i would say that my feelings about it now are that when it comes to it me as a portrait photographer 80 percent of what i do is all about connection is all about getting to know the person spending time with them in fact 80 percent of the skill i think of being a portrait photographer is people skills 20 percent, if that is the technical side of it if you can get somebody to be relaxed in front of the camera you can get a great photo of them and dare i say it with whatever kit you're using you know, be it a, your great camera your really expensive camera or maybe your phone if you can get that person to be relaxed that's what's going to make the picture look at these pictures here these are i always look back with fondness at these ones here the one on the left hand side a guy called ken doxy who was from a place called Burton on Trent in uh, in the UK? Wonderful, wonderful man. Now, I love that picture because to me that kind of shows it. Kind of gives me a bit of a grounding to the fact that I how much I feel I've changed as a photographer because there is no way that I would have ever had that kind of a connection, that kind of a behind the scenes picture of a photo shoot ever a few years ago because I would have been so concerned about the technicals. But by changing my mindset, by keeping it simple, it allowed me to have that connection. And I treasure that. I totally treasure that. And you can see the picture on the right hand side there of him. These are the guys here. Wonderful, you know, real piercing eyes. But rather than, you know, again, think back to the start, you know, when we had the picture of Stephen Cook, the boxer, the really close up picture where he just looked like he was it was like the lights were on, but there was no one home. He was just looking straight through you you're being looked at i would say you when you look at these two gentlemen here they're looking at you there is definitely a connection and i i love this when you get that you know you're going to be on a winner absolute winner i mean look at these ones here again just great fun the picture on the left hand side there i actually always get a little bit of a shudder when i look at that picture there because i remember the story behind it I'll, I'll quickly let you know, this is a, a real sheep farmer in Wales. And I went there with two friends of mine, Ian Munro and Anthony Crothers. And when we'd kind of, uh, I'd set up in this little field by this wonderful kind of uh, stone wall, there was a farm gate. Now, you may know that the farmers, they use a lot of that orange twine that you see the hay bales all wrapped in. He had some of that holding the gate. There's a metal gate to the left-hand side of where he is now. He had that all shut holding you know with this twine now when we've gone into the field we've climbed over the gate didn't want to disturb anything and set up when he came in afterwards once we'd all got set up so he could just come in and just casually have his picture taken he opened the gate and dropped the twine down to the floor i've then turned around to start to get you know get my camera move the tripod in but as i moved his foot caught on the twine and we just hear this almighty thud I look round and he's fallen down. This gentleman was, I think he's like late eighties. He'd fallen down and his head was that close to one of the rocks that had fallen off the wall. Could have been a very, very different result with that one, but yeah, it's amazing how you get this kind of recall with pictures, isn't it? How, you know, I can look at every portrait that I've taken and I can remember almost everything about that portrait, where it was, what happened, what went right, what went wrong, so on and so forth um all right so have a look at these two. Oh, yeah two more gentlemen uh yeah wonderful just just great connection if you do get chance have a look at that project for me it's 13 or 3945 portraits.com and you'll get to see some of the uh 
uh, some of the portraits that I've taken of these wonderful people. So yeah, talking is a big thing. Now it's all right me sitting here saying, just talk, you know, take your time, sit down, relax and talk to them. Not everybody feels comfortable. Not everybody knows what to talk about. So that's the thing, isn't it? You know, you're going to go and meet a stranger here. What on earth do you talk about? Now, I always remember this. I'm, I don't forget who it was told me years and years and years ago. If you don't know what to talk about, to get a conversation, just imagine that the person in front of you has this on their forehead. M-M-F-I. Make me feel important talk about them who are they what have they done what you know how long they live there what jobs have they have what's the family what interests all that kind of stuff take it off you put it onto them make me feel important show an interest in that particular person now i want to just show you a uh, i've got a couple of videos i remember the technicals of how we do this here now so i want to show you a short video uh, of a, a wonderful man a wonderful veteran uh, and I want you to look at it. It's, it's a bit of a funny story about when he had his hair cut during World War II. Uh, and when you watch it, enjoy the story that he tells you. This is David Edwards. Enjoy the story, but also look at how relaxed he is. This was the very first time that I met this gentleman. All right. So let me just come out of this uh, presentation for a second. We'll go to the uh, video. And we'll press uh, play. Before I went to the army, my father, who was in the army, he was a sergeant in the Monmouthshire Regiment for quite a long time. And he said to me, before you go, Dave, get yourself a haircut. And so religiously, I went to the barbers and I had what in those days was called a short back and sides. And I had this haircut and it was short back and sides. where they cut it up to there, and very short. And I mon prayed with the Mormons Regiment. Was it the Mormons or was I in training? Anyway, I was on parade and a lot of young fellas like me were there. And the the corporal, I, I think he was a corporal, he had a big stick they used to put under their left arm and strut about everywhere giving orders. And he came along and he said, when I touches you on the shoulder, with my stick, it means Eckert. And I thought, oh, I'm, I stood there in the line and I thought, oh, Dad was right. Yeah, that was clever. That was sensible, telling me. And I've had one, so I'm okay. Suddenly the stick comes down on my shoulder from behind. Eckert, he growled, you know, Eckert. And I made a mistake and I turned and I said, I had one yesterday, Corporal. Oh, did you have one yesterday? Oh, I see, you had one yesterday. You'll have another one, a bloody proper one. <laughs> That's how they thought haircuts were important, you know. So I marched off with this group, and there was one chap, they called him Curly, and he was, he was Curly. Uh, and he stood with us, and he stood in front of us, I can see that stick now, he was brandishing it and putting it back under his arm and all that. And he said, Thompson, I think his name was Thompson, Thompson, you were first. And Thompson goes, and he came out and it was all, everything, all the curls and everything. Brilliant. Oh, all righty. So let's just uh, bring the presentation back in just there. Hopefully you can still hear me. I've noticed there's a, uh, there are some questions coming in. We're going to dive into those, but I've just noticed one by a guy called Darren. And he's put, how is it that your subjects appear to be looking straight down the lens in the final images when though they were looking above the camera straight at you? Darren, that is a great question because obviously I'm saying that camera's on the tripod, my finger's on there, and I'm above it maintaining eye contact. The way that works, Darren, is because obviously I'm maintaining the contact with them, which is helping them to be relaxed. So then when it comes to me actually taking the shot, what I will then do is if I was photographing you, I'd, I'd be above the camera talking, talking. and I'd, I'd have my finger there and go, actually, Darren, just do me a favor. Just look straight down the lens for me. Just there. That's it. Just straight down there. That's it. There you go. Click. Bang. Anyway, what were you saying about such and such again? So I am still kind of saying, do me a favor. Just look straight down the lens there just for a second, rather than me going, right, ready? Here we go. Okay, hold that, hold that, because the minute I start doing that, 
ruins it. I will just casually say, just uh, just uh, from where you are now, just look straight down the lens for me, just there. Just look, that's it, bang. Really low key, no big build up, because the minute I start to build it up and change the way I'm talking about things, that's going to make them a bit more stressed out again. All right. All right. So let's uh, let's have a quick thing. So one of the things I want to say as well is there's loads of stuff I've written down about this, but I'm telling you about talking. We've talked about the MMFI, make me feel important. But above all, still be yourself. It is so tempting when we look at other photographers around the world, the way they do certain things to try to emulate them. And there's no problem with that so long as we just take little bits from it but not to the point that it starts to change us because the more we try to be like somebody else, the worse it'll be. Prime example, and I've got a little saying here because I've heard him say it, a friend of mine, Peter Hurley, he's got a saying where he's got someone in front of the camera and he just says crazy stuff. He says, smile like a tomato. Now, if I said that to you, especially, you know, Darren, I'm doing your pitch now. If I said that to you, you'd go, what? It wouldn't get the reaction. When Peter says it, it's totally different because that's Peter. Smile like a tomato isn't something that I do. They call these things here Hurleyisms, and he's well known for them. It really isn't my thing. So make me feel important, talking. But above all else, don't just talk, listen. That is massively important. In fact, this is way up there in the things that I have learned that can have a massive impact on the portraits that you take. So I'm going to give you a prime example with this now. I always talk about this one because it is just, the, for me, it's the perfect illustration of the importance of not just talking, but listening. And I'm going to refer back to this guy here. This is a World War II veteran called John Sleep, who we've sadly lost, lost him this year, he reached the ripe old age of 100 years of age. But I'm going to turn this around now, right? I'm going to kind of talk about this in a slightly different way in that I want you now to imagine you're me. OK, you put yourself in my shoes that you're now going to photograph John Sleep. This is the first time you'll have ever met him. You're now on your way to his house. All your kits in the car. You get there. You knock on the door. John answers the door. You go in, you sit down, you have a nice cup of tea or coffee. You notice as well that John's daughter's there, which is great because he's got somebody there that he knows. So he feels safe. It's also good for you because it's kind of like, you know, safety, security and all that kind of stuff we have to think about these days. But you're having a really good conversation with John. But one of the things that you notice is when you're talking to him, it almost appears like he's about to cry. And you kind of ask him about this. And John tells you that the reason for this is because he's suffered with post-traumatic stress all of his life since the war. He goes on to tell you the story behind that is that when he was in the Netherlands, he was walking along the grass bank of a dike. And as he's walking along, he sees a, a house and a tree. As he gets nearer, he realizes it's not a tree, but a German tank with camouflage. The shock of it makes him grab his Bren gun and fire a few rounds at the tank. The tank comes alive and fires a shell straight at him. And it lands in the grass bank directly beneath John's feet and explodes, causes him horrific injuries. Now, he then gets taken to hospital and he goes from one hospital to another, to another, to another, until eventually he lands back in the UK. Now, John then tells you that the reason he's gone from one hospital to another wasn't because of his injuries, but was because of the way that he was behaving when he was at hospital. He was shouting, swearing, being abusive, a real handful to the staff that they just couldn't deal with him. He then tells you that he actually didn't know he was doing that. He didn't know he was behaving like that. He was doing it in his sleep. They just couldn't deal with it. Now, that's really sad. But the really, really sad thing about it is the fact that he then goes on to tell you that up until recently, when his wife was still alive, in his late 90s, he would still, in the middle of the night, start shouting, screaming, you know, giving out orders, just being really abusive. He didn't know he was doing it. He, st he still suffered with it in his late 90s and that's just awful post-traumatic stress so like i said you're sat sat there now this is you listening to john tell you this you're about to take this guy's portrait but upon hearing this i'm gonna ask you a question i know you can't answer but just think about it now that you've learned that about john would you photograph him differently would you do something different to all the other veterans that you photographed would it make you think of doing I've got to be really careful here. There's something else I've got to do. Now, I only throw that out for you there just to think about it. Because for me, 
I had alarm bells going off. When John was telling me this story, I'm thinking, hold on a second, I can't photograph him like I've done everybody else. Because if I use a flash, I don't know what that's going to do. Could that flash cause a, a negative reaction from him? And it's all well and good, you know, me leaving my happy home to come and photograph this man and then leaving him in a state of distress. I can't do that. So what I did by listening, I thought, got to do it different. So what I did was just go to the car and I always carry with me not just a flash, but a video light, a daylight balanced video light. So then I put that into the softbox. It fits into the softbox. I turn that on. And it's great because what you see is what you get. The light's just there. I get John to sit down in front of the, the background. I can see where the highlights and the shadows are. Really easy. I then go to my camera, put it on the tripod. Same thing, focus point on John's face. But another couple of things I do that are different is that I turn on silent shutter. I also plug in a cable release. So when I'm talking to John and I ask John to tell me about you know, not the not horrible things during the war, because that's just not what you want to do. Talk about for a successful, nice looking portrait. I said, John, tell me about your training. What was it like learning to be a paratrooper? And he just went into one. And as he's talking, I'm just taking pictures when it feels right. Taking pictures. He has no idea. Absolutely no idea. Sometimes he's looking straight at me or, you know, I kind of move myself. So I'm right by the camera. He's looking at me. Talk, and I'm just taking pictures. He has no idea until eventually. He stops to take some breath and I show him it. And he's going, I never knew you were doing that. I said, well, you know, ways and means, John, ways and means. So this is this is the, you know, the things, massive things that I've learned from photographing everyday people. It isn't about you. It's about them. It's not about what they can do for you. It's what you can do for them by you spending time slowing down, talking, listening, making them feel important. You can make them look wonderful you can make them look like them in a picture moving on this one here there's some other things that i want to tell you that i do uh i won't go too much into the story of this but it was basically this was a, a photograph i took of a, a chimpanzee called zayden when i was working on an animals project and the thing is she wasn't outside where all the other chimps were playing around and my friends were photographing this one remained indoors uh she'd been through a lot of abuse in her in her short life she'd suffered um, abuse on the beaches in Spain when she was just used for entertainment and when I looked at her she had lacerations on her shoulders and cigarette burns down her forearms she was severely severely traumatized and so didn't go out and I'm just staring at her through the the big thick security glass even though the doors were open she wouldn't go out and she's just looking down and I was completely drawn to her the reason I think I was completely drawn to her is because I was thinking what are you thinking about you know the the, the picture when I took it and then I edited it. It was the first time, honestly, it was the first time ever that a picture stopped me in my tracks and made me want to know more. It's, it doesn't matter that it was me that took the picture, but it just drew me in. I wanted to know more about it. And it kind of make, reminds me of something that you hear people say a lot, or maybe it's just me. I have heard this a lot. It's that you hear people say, my pictures tell a story. And I've always kind of found that a weird thing to say because if they're having to tell you that their pictures tell a story, then I don't think their pictures tell a story. <laughs> I think as the viewer, when you're looking at a picture, as a viewer, you make up a story or you look at it and you go, God, what are they thinking about? I wonder what they've done. You start to imagine stuff. You shouldn't have to be told the story. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But this looking away from the, uh, the camera, I find as well, can be really powerful when you're taking portraits. Some people, you can just get a sense that they don't feel comfortable looking straight down the lens, like John Sleep or like Darren, who I was photographing earlier. They might not like that, but one way that we can get them to be relaxed is by not making them look at the camera, get them to look past the camera. So one thing I will do with people is, is kind of, you know, I've already taken the shot, hopefully when they're looking at the camera, but then I'll say, look, we're going to take some shots, uh, some other shots now, again, keeping it nice and calm and slow. And I'll say, look, wherever I put my hand, just turn your nose, turn your eyes. In fact, turn your whole face towards my hand and try to look through my fingers. And I'll kind of like do a clock face rotation. So I'll start up high and I move it down and then take a shot there and take a shot there, take a shot there. Then go, right, now we'll repeat it on the other side. So by the end of the shoot, I've got one, you know, I've got a picture of when the person's looking straight down the camera. And I've also got pictures of them looking past the camera at different heights. Now, 
I don't know what's going to look best for that person. I'm going to get a feel during the shoot if they're comfortable looking at the camera, but I don't know which picture is going to work best. But I'll tell you what, since I've done it this particular way, when I have all the images open in Lightroom as like thumbnails in grid view, when you do that and you have all the pictures that you've taken open at once, it's almost like an arrow just goes like that. It points to the picture that just works. I don't know how it happens, but it just does. Because before what I would normally do is have all the pictures there, I'd have it like in survey mode, and I'd be using my left and right arrow keys and pressing X for reject or P for pick, and I'd have to whittle it down till eventually I got the pictures that I wanted or the, you know whittle it down to the, the winning picture. I've never had to do that since I've done this. Put them all up in grid form and just relax. Just look at the pictures and your eyes will naturally go to the one that works. I can't explain it. It just works. And it just works for some people and not others. You know, it just it just does. And I think it adds a whole different element to it. You know, I when I was doing this initial project, I did look at pictures from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. And there are pictures that I would call uh Pitch, uh, hold on a second, I've got messages here saying we can't see your screen. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, screen two. There we go. You can see the screen now, but at least you can see me. At least you can see me. So the uh, the guy, let's just go, go back a slide just here. You've only missed a couple of slides. Uh, this guy here looking looking away from the camera there. It just, it just seems to work, and it doesn't work with some people. It does with others. When I was researching this actual project, it was a case of, uh oh didn't see the picture of the monkey let me show you the picture of the monkey there you go there's there's john sleep that you uh that you photographed really well by changing to using a video light there is the picture of the chimp all right looking away from the camera it just draws you in hopefully you can see that you can't i was just i remember having this on my big screen thinking what has she been through first time i ever felt that about a picture but let me just zoom through here so obviously we've got this guy here that we've talked about doing the thing going round in like the clock face rotation and then we've got these photos here. So sometimes, you know, I've got portraits. If you look at my portfolios where they're looking at the camera, sometimes they're not looking uh, at the camera, they're looking past it. And it just works well for some people, not for others. One of the questions I get is when you say, oh, do you ever show people the pictures when you're taking them? And the answer is yes. Yeah, I do. I, I always will show the people the pictures when I'm taking them, but I never used to. Because I was always thinking, oh, no, I can't show you yet because they've not been retouched. You're not seeing the final image. But that doesn't really matter. But I also have changed the way now that I would show people the pictures. Let me just explain it. Again, I'll go back to Darren, who I've photographed already, obviously. When I'm taking portraits, I'm shooting tethered. You've may have, you may have seen that in a couple of pictures already when I was photographing the veterans. So I'm always shooting tethered into my laptop. Now, at some point, what I used to do was this. I'd get the laptop. And I'd turn it around towards the person I'm photographing and going, Darren, you look amazing. Look at you look absolutely fantastic in this. Now, that's all well and good to say it that way if you're photographing a model because they'll lap it up. But if you're photographing an everyday person, it's going to have a negative because they're going to start to feel like, oh, no, I don't like having my picture taken. Feel really self-conscious. Oh, no. And it's just going to ruin it. Now, you're doing it for the right reasons. You're thinking that by me complimenting them, it's going to make them feel great about themselves and they're going to be more inclined to sit there and have more pictures taken. But I, my experience is it has the opposite effect. So I don't do that. I still show them the pictures, but I do it differently. So this is what I do now. I've got my laptop. Again, we'll go back to Darren that I'm photographing. And when I'm ready to sort of show them, I'll pause and I'll get the laptop and I'll turn it towards and I'll go, Darren, I am really happy with these. The lighting on these this lighting in here is fantastic. These are coming out really, really well. I'm so happy with how the, I'm basically compliment myself. So it's almost like a bit of reverse psychology. I'm complimenting myself. So then what happens is they're sitting there thinking, oh, he seems happy. And they become, it sounds weird, but they've become more inclined then to sit there and do what you want to do and take more pictures because it's making you feel good about what you're doing, not how good they're looking. It sounds weird, but just give it a go. So don't compliment them compliment yourself but yeah i always always will shoot tethered be it to a laptop to a, an ipad or whatever you cannot beat shooting tethered it's just it, if anything it slows you down as well because it gets you able to sort of see things nice and big you can slow down look at it things that you maybe wouldn't have noticed on the back of your camera so yeah a huge huge benefit when you're shooting tethered so at the start of this i said to you what is a successful portrait 
Is it the contrast? Is it the sharpness? Is it the skin tone? Is it the expression? Is it the post-production? I'm hoping in a way that if maybe your thoughts were different at the start, you might be changing now. But I think a successful portrait is when they say, it is so them. That is so them. And obviously you're not gonna get that unless there's a connection. Uh, look at this picture here. I'm just wonderful. I love this picture here. This guy called Alby who was sadly lost. There's no way that would have happened if we didn't have a connection when I'd photographed him. Um, let me sum this up. Things that I want to go through then. How, if I can wrap it, wrap it up into some small bit of advice about taking successful portraits. The first bit of advice I'll give you, slow down. Definitely, definitely slow down. Talk more and take less photographs. And more importantly, it's all about the subject, all about the subject. When we look at pictures that we've taken, it should give you recall. You should look at those pictures and remember where you were, what happened, the great time that you had with that person. And that should be the same thing for them. You know, under promise, over deliver. Don't necessarily kind of, uh, don't outstay your welcome. Make it easy to be able to go back another time or for another photographer to go back another time. Just some other examples of pictures here. I love these pictures here. <laughs> and some examples of like what people have said you know again going back to that thing with valerian when i had that lovely message from maria saying how nice it was that you know the beautiful image which was great but the fact that you spent some time with him as well so yeah now albie here what was lovely was i actually had a letter come through from his daughter when he sadly passed away and i just want to read out what she put in this little letter it's only a little card because obviously we're wrapping up in a minute but she's put i remember what you said glenn that there's no such thing as a bad photo looking through the years of photos, and now I realize totally what you mean. Now the hard part of living without him. Just, yeah, really powerful stuff, but lovely. You know that you've got the connection when the family starts to get on side. It's just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So yeah, me being what, trying to be wise here when photography moves from being all about the technicals to being all about the subject and person is when it moves from being a like to a love, a nice to a need, and a passion to a purpose. So what is a successful portrait? For me, a portrait is who they are. It's not just about a likeness or anything capturing stuff onto light sensitive material. It's capturing who they are. If you can get someone to say, that is so them, that to me is a successful portrait. But you'll only get that when you spend time to talk, to listen, to make me feel important. All right, so I hope that's been useful. Let me just dive in to have a quick look at some uh, some questions that we've got here. Uh, diving through, I hope those few moments when you couldn't see the screen, but you could see me. I hope that was okay. Uh, got a, picture, a question here from Rob. He's put, how much of a difference does it make to shoot on a tripod uh, without it allowing you to be out of behind the camera to make eye contact with the person you're photographing? I, I think I know what you mean there, Rob. Uh, but to me, it massive. It makes a huge difference. Rather than me hand holding a camera and doing this, if I can just put it onto the tripod, it gives them a focus point to sort of, you know, they know where the direction they're going to be looking in. It also allows me to, it helps me if we're looking at the technicals, once they're looking at the camera on the tripod to position the light. But when it comes to having the eye contact, it's easy. You know, maintaining that contact with them with the camera on a tripod is easy just above the camera, keep looking. And eventually, like I did with Darren, when you want them to look at the camera, just say, just do me a favor, just look straight on the lens for me, just there. That's it, that's it, just straight there, bang. Nice and easy. Hopefully that answered that question there for you, Rob. Um, let's have a quick look here. Uh, question from Darren, got that one from Darren. Question from uh, Marie, is it? Your background, what type and size? It looks really versatile. It is actually, yeah, good question there, uh, Mari, Marie. Uh, it's actually by, made by a company called FJ Westcott, uh, and it's called the X-Drop. And the actual grey that I was using there, I feel like I've made it in life. It's called the Glinduous Vintage Grey. <laughs> That's all it is. But yeah, it is very, very versatile, packs down to hardly anything, so it's great. And it's really light. Uh, if ever it falls over, it won't damage anything. Question from Roxanne, would you take photos while they speak? It can be very authentic, but it could surprise them and make them jump. Um no, I don't think I would. I don't think I'd take them. I know I did with John, but it was timing it when he would pause, uh, but not while they're talking, because I think if they do hear a click while you're talking, in a way that kind of sounds like you're not listening because you're doing stuff. So maybe, maybe not. Uh, another question from Darren. Do you always focus on subjects in chairs, um, in their own chairs, or do you ever find the chair with them sit down? 
Uh, when it comes to the veterans, Darren, um, I'll always take a chair with me because sometimes where these veterans live, it may be in like a care home and they're very modern looking chairs and they just wouldn't suit uh, the kind of look that I'm going for these pictures. So I'll always have something with me. Uh, but sometimes like the picture with Ken Doxy, where I was really smiling and laughing with him, he was sat on a red chair. The actual chair we did the picture was blue. Just use Photoshop to change it. So it just looked better. Um, question from Serge Glynn. What you are describing is totally correct. And I'm completely convinced it works. Great job. But there's always a but. Make people feel at ease and important. That is very important. But what if your model is not ready to invest time and you have no chance to make the person feel at ease? Um then I would delay taking the picture. Simple. You know I mean, it, it is as simple as that. Now, if it's a paid job, it's, it's different. You've got to do it no matter what. But, you know, what if it's a paid job, are you being photographed to capture them? Or is it a picture that's for promotional work and what have you? When people aren't really bothered about character, it's just their look. If it was me trying to capture the person, the character, the real them, I would just spend more time talking. If, you, if you're getting that feel from them, you've started doing the photo shoot too soon. That, that's that's all I could say, really, I guess. Um, we can't see your screen. We can't see your screen. Hopefully you can. Question, Scott, what f-stop do you find is good for portraits? Uh, if it's a shot where they're seated or standing, I always, I'm more around about f-11-ish. Uh, but my personal choice when it's a real close-in shot, because that's what I wanted to do with these ones here, the veterans, uh, I was shooting quite wide open, f-2. But I'd normally go for around about f-4, something like that. Cool. Right. The last slide to show you is this one here, BenQ5. That's obviously for the promo code, valid until the 23rd of December. Folks, I hope that's been useful. We've gone a little bit over time. I hope Alexandra doesn't mind. Uh, but uh, check out that link there. Also, check out the Portraits Project, 3945portraits.com, my own website, glyndewis.com. Folks, thank you so much for your time. Uh, by all means, drop me an email. I will always get back to you. Take care now.